Our first two speakers are with the Standish Group, which has a long history since the 1990s of studying why software projects succeed or fail. Jim Johnson, our first speaker, is the founder and chairman of the Standish Group. He's been professionally involved in the computer industry for over 40 years and has a long list of books, papers, articles, and speeches. He has a combination of technical marketing and research achievements focused on mission critical applications in technology. He's best known for his research on project performance and early rec recognizing technology trends. He's a pioneer of modern research techniques and continues to advance in the research industry through case-based analytical technology. So it's a great pleasure to call on Jim Johnson, our first speaker. Well, I want to thank you for having me at this conference. And um, what we're going to talk about today is a little different than what we normally talk about. We're actually starting a new chapter in the chaos research. And that involves uh, a bunch of universities, a number of universities. And that's why we're here today to announce the program that we're just beginning with partnership with the Antwerp University and Antwerp Management School. So I'm really excited, but I'd like to start uh, by showing you a, a little video um, on some of the clouds that, that um, Hans put together to kind of get a little bit idea of what we're going to be talking about. It's, oops. If I knew how to work this thing, I'd be better off, but you know, we'll, we'll start. There we go. You don't have the music cons, huh? Oh, well. So um, what we're really trying to do is to take the, the chaos research to the next level. And um, I did a talk at the University of Antwerp in uh, March, and we came up with this partnership idea where we're going to give the database to universities so they can work on it and extend it and learn more about the ideas of project failure, why projects succeed, why projects uh, don't succeed, where are the, some of the segments and ideas that are gonna be coming from. So we're really interested as we move forward to extend the database from a proprietary database, which we've been doing for 22 years, and move that out and move it to students. One of the things we did some experiments with the University of Rotterdam with some students recently, and uh, we're also working with the Antwerp University on some interesting things. So um, this was just a one minute tape. But I wanted to talk about how we actually got started in this thing because I think it's pretty interesting. I, I began my career working for Digital Equipment Corporation in the early uh, 70s, actually late 60s. And I was working on a project um, to uh, it's like, basically, it was an Excel spreadsheet project. And um, I learned there about some of the techniques that we forgot about over the years. And, and I, I wrote a story called uh, Agile is Old School, because at Digital, we did programs like we do Agile and Scrum back then. And as we formalized uh, the project uh, maintenance and project uh, management, we kind of lost some of that things, but we've kind of grabbed it back with some of the scrum ideas. But we, we, we wanted to, to know about that because it was an agile type environment where we got the jobs done fairly quickly, but we had a lot of user input. And, um, and so they were really involved. And then from there, I, I did some interesting work uh, working with the universe, uh, the state of Massachusetts where we developed the job bank, um, which was a, a, a really good idea, and that worked out pretty well, but that was late and over budget, and so I, I started to look at why that was happening. We had, um, I worked for Tandem for a little while, and we had this uh, one customer that developed an oil trading uh, uh, application, 
And that failed because they got the system up and running. It was a beautiful system. But they didn't ever talk to the traders in, in Dallas, Texas that, that traded oil. And that was done in the back rooms and, and uh, luncheons and uh, uh, dining halls in Dallas. And so that whole system failed. And so we see that. And as I went forward in my career, I, I worked on applications and projects such as FAA, uh, flight information systems. And as I began that career and working on that, I kept seeing this pattern of project failure. And then uh, we started uh, the Standish Group in uh, 1985. And we started it as a technology company. But we started it on the premise that if we collected lots of data and had different points of data that we could do predictive analysis. And we got really good at it. We, we, we predicted uh, trends in IT and we focused mainly on transaction processing and mission critical applications. Well, we could look at the future through this mechanism of triangulation through lots of groups of data. And so we were able to predict interesting things that people were not were saying that was not going to happen. So in 1994, for example, we predicted the death of DCE, the same year that Gartner Group predicted it would be widespread. We, we predicted the, the advent of the virtual enterprise the same year that Bill Gates said that it was a fad. We could predict these things because we collected lots of data. So in 1994, we did this little experiment, we called it the chaos report, where we collected lots of data on projects and we did focus groups, we did interviews, we did um, uh, lots of surveys and profiles and we wrote the, uh, the chaos report in 1994. Now we thought that report would be, that's it. We would do that report, would write about it. It was published in Software Magazine or Application Trend Magazine, and it got some <laughs> widespread use. And people kept coming to us and saying, well, are you going to do that report again? Are you going to continue it? And we thought, oh, we're really interested in this other stuff with mission critical applications, high availability, transaction processing. We've been working on that for a number of years. But, you know, the, the GSA came to us and said, we're going to, we have $14 billion worth of projects. They're all in, in dire need. And I said, well, you know, well, let's look at your data. Let's talk to you about it. And so we started what was then called the KS University uh, program, which we would bring in industry, uh, uh, notorious people from around the industry, around the world, to a, to a conference, and we would work on it and look at the issues surrounding why projects fail, why they succeeded, and we did about 500 of these groups over the last uh, 15 years. And so um, as, we, as we looked at that and tried to figure out what kind of things were successful, it was really important to have lots of data, and it's really important to be able to triangulate that data. So we, what we did was we had lots of different instruments. We had surveys, we had these work groups, we had eight different types of surveys. Some would ask about projects, some would ask about the executive sponsor, some would ask about the user involvement. So we had all these different instruments and we had all this data and, and we were going forward learning a lot and we were trying to figure out what kind of data could we get what is a reasonable kind of data that would work? Some of the instruments were, didn't work at all. You know, we tried to get the data, but we couldn't get it because people just didn't know. Uh, recently, uh, uh, we were asked, why don't we use function points for sizing? Well, we couldn't get the data on sizing. Most people don't know how to do sizing. So, and what kind of data is included? What kind of costs are included? So we, we learned what we could get, and we also learned what we couldn't get. And so that was the extension of, of the, the next phase, which started about 10 years ago, where we moved into two instruments. 
The two instruments are we're going to do a profile of the capability of the organization. So what we do is we do a work group and we have about 50 questions and, and an interview and uh, it takes about an hour or so to do this and we profile the organization on their capability. The second instrument we do, we, we have a profile of projects and in, in sessions uh, later today we're going to show you the, what's in that profile. But it's about you know, what's the size of the project, what's the methodology, what's, how long did it take, what was the cost, how many people involved, what was the competence, of the, what was the outcome, did they get value from it, were the customers satisfied. And one thing we learned early on is that when we look at this data, it's not about true metrics because we did this focus group one time, we had, actually there's a series of focus groups, and in one of the focus groups, we asked them, you know, tell us about the last project you did. And so we went, we, but we had the CFO, we had the pro project manager, and we had the CIO. And we asked them to write down what they thought the project was successful, was it challenged, or was it failed, and we gave them the definition, our common definition. So we had them write down so they couldn't see each other's answers. And I can remember one group we did where the CFO said the project failed, the CIO said it was challenged, and the project manager said it was successful. And I said, okay, three different answers for the same question. Then I asked, went around and went around again, and I said, well, let's, let's talk about it. So we talked about it for about 10 minutes, and other people got in because it was 12 people in the session. And I said, now what do you think? And the project manager says, well, since the people aren't using it, I guess it's a failed project. And the, C and the, the CFO said, well, but the project was completed and everybody sort of did the job, you know, and we got it, uh, but, you know, it just people just didn't like it. I think it's a successful project. And then the CFO just shook his head and says, I just don't know. So for the one question, whether the project is successful, failed, or challenged, we had six different answers. Six different answers of the same question. So then I realized that if, it's, if people are going to give you their opinion, it should be our opinion. And so that's when we started really looking at case-based reasoning where we could have people input the cases but then we would adjudicate the cases based upon what we thought it was. So the KS database is a collection of projects with lots of data that's been looked at in several instances and put a, a, a trained adjudicator can tell whether people are lying, telling the truth, or whether they think it's right. And, and this happens all the time. And so we have to, as, a, as an organization for the give us correct research, we have to make sure that the data is correct. And we throw out about 50% of projects because the data isn't uh, good enough. But what does all this mean? Well, the things we've really, one of the key things after 22 years of looking at this, I found that, that if we really want to be successful in projects, we call it the winning hand. And so the secrets of project, software project success is number one, it has to be small. So it has to be a small project. Six people, six months, little project succeeds very well. Large projects don't succeed very well. 81% of the winning hand of projects is successful. So number one, it's small. Number two, use an agile process. It works. People, self-directing teams work. Number three, you have to have a good sponsor. And I think for when I look at when I look at successful projects, I see a highly skilled executive sponsor. Someone that can inspire the team, that works hard, and can daydream, that has a lot of imagination. And I think people overlook daydreaming as something that is not very nice, you know, uh, daydreaming. But I think one of the key to project success and the key to innovation is having somebody that can daydream. And um, so I'm a big 
fan of daydreaming these days, and I talk a lot about it. So if we look at that, if we look at having good emotional maturity, and what is emotional maturity is, is building consensus, is, is getting people to agree on things, is getting good feedback, it's making sure that you're getting the, the objective opinions of people and being able to encourage people to work on the project. And of course, a talented staff that can actually do the job is, is always uh, important. And if you have those five ingredients, then you have an 81% chance you'll be successful. If you have a large project with incompetent people, with a deadbeat dad sponsor who doesn't show up, um, and if you have uh, people always fighting at each other, your, your chances of a project going successful is, uh, is, is less than, than probably 20%. So that's, uh, that's where I am at, and um, I'm going to get, turn over the program to my esteemed colleague, Hans Mulder. Good morning. This is a uh, real honor to be here, standing next to Jim Johnson. Uh, he started in the 1990s with his uh, Standish Chaos database, and now it holds more than 100,000 of case studies. And as a scientist, this is a real treasure. Uh, more than 100,000 case studies of IT projects. However, the results of those uh, case studies are that most projects do not succeed. And if they do, they don't create value. And as a professor at the university, it is not a nice idea to teach your students that most of the time they will not be successful in their careers. So it would be a good idea, I think, to learn from this database, to learn from the methodology from the Standish Group. So more than about 10 years ago, we met with the Standish Group and we decided how can we collaborate? How can we collaborate as a university with this still Propriety database because it was only accessible by the people of the Stennis group themselves. So this year in March, Jim gave the presentation at the university in Antwerp and we decided to change the game, to make the university a part of the Stennis group. And therefore the dean of the university signed a contract with Stennis that we were the first university to be allowed to use this data collection, but furthermore, to enrich it, to use our professors, our PhD students, and our master students to use the database for our assignments. So you saw in the first minute a video from the University of Rotterdam where the students, 50 of those, were working for companies and using the database of Standish to make a benchmark, to see not only how that particular case study operates, but compare to, let's say, 50,000 other projects. And that gives a much more professional insight in how do projects fail, succeed, or create value. By the way, this is my department, beautiful Antwerp, an old, old city. And what we try to do then is to provide the universities with a kind of collaboration um, uh, system called CAS, the Chaos University System. And we are now in the process of uh, 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 reaching out to all kinds of organizations to getting grants. So uh, we have still the opportunity to uh, join with other universities and to let them share in this uh, way of doing uh, the research. Even so, we are capable of giving the universities uh, a share of those uh, grants as well. So it means that we're not only talking about how to do the research, but also how to do the funding. And I think that is a very interesting part. Uh, we started only in March with the idea. We had an agreement with the university in April. And now already in the low countries, we have more than five universities joining this kind of collaboration. So where we're hoping for in this coming uh, days is that we will be here at the conference with our own info desk. The desk will be uh, that, uh, that available for answering questions. But also if you're interested to sign up for the Chaos University system. So perhaps we can collaborate in the coming years together on this topic of how to make IT more valuable 
for society as a whole. So that is the, the, the picture behind me. So we're looking for cases. This suitcase is an example of cases because it also gives uh, not only the possibility for universities, but also for business and government alike. When we saw the first video clip, uh, it was taken from the hearings from the Dutch parliament. It was estimated that the annual loss of um, uh, investments in IT for government only would be between about 1 billion till 5 billion euros. So that is a large amount of money you could spend on much better ways. So what we're trying to do is to have case studies to change, you could say, this kind of, of, uh, of game. The way we do it, and that is of course as a scientist most of importance, we use the design science research approach. So you could say that the standard artifact is the methodology, the data collection, and also the database, which is in the inner circle of the design cycle. The knowledge base is being formed by the universities to be sure that the data is valid. And if you can uh, remember, Jim said it's very hard to do that. And on the left side, we have the environment, which means we have to do the relevant cycle. You have to be relevant for your industry, relevant for your government, and you can do that by doing field testing. And that way, we are organizing the methodology behind the Standish Group. So thank you very much for your time, and I hope to see you this coming days in the, the conference.